We're good. Okay. How y'all doing this afternoon? Good. What about, uh, what about Brother Jason? Very good message. That was, that was very encouraging to me. Um, I think, for my part, I think we're going to start out with a review of what the Passover is. Uh, the story is found in Exodus chapter 12. But before we get to that story, I want to make one little side trip to point out that the Passover was established before the covenant at Mount Sinai. Now everybody tells us the law has been done away with, the law of Moses. That was the covenant at Mount Sinai. This was established prior to that. We read in Exodus 19.1, it says in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So we understand the time frame of when all this happened. Now before we're going, let's, let's go to the Father and ask for a word of wisdom. Heavenly Father, Most High God, we come to you, Lord, we humble our hearts. We ask you to forgive our transgressions, Lord. We thank you for letting us be together here today and study your word. We thank you for the celebration of this Passover that we've come to join in fellowship with each other. And we thank you for that blood that cleanses us from our sin. Father, we ask that you open our eyes and ears to see and hear the things that you need us to know from your word. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Passover sacrifice. Amen. <clears throat> now, let's go and read the story from Exodus 12. Exodus 12 gives us a story of the, how the Passover was set up. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, <clears throat> according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. <clears throat> they shall eat the flesh the same night roasted with fire. And they shall eat. They shall eat flesh the same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both his head and his legs, along with his entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over till the morning. But whatever is left till the morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat in this manner, with your loins girded with your sandals on your feet and with your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste it is the Lord's Passover for I that's the Lord speaking for I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whosoever eats anything leaven from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day, 
of the month at evening. You shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. So we see they had to sacrifice a lamb. They had to take some blood, put it on the doorpost and the lintel. Now what was the reason for the blood? Remember what he said in verse 13? The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Why did the first Passover take place? What was the reason for it? The people were enslaved in Egypt, and they cried out to God. <clears throat> he heard their cries, and he chose to deliver them. Well, how did they come to be enslaved in Egypt to start with? If you remember, if you've ever read the story, heard the story, there were seven years of abundance in the land, followed by seven years of famine. Joseph, who had been sold into slavery by his brothers, had wound up being second in command under Pharaoh. And he had ordered large stores of food to be stockpiled during the seven years of bounty, which he then sold during the famine. It was during the famine that his brothers came to buy food, and eventually the whole family of Israel moved down to the land of Goshen in Egypt. And the famine continued seven years. And here's what happened the last couple years of that famine. Genesis 47, 13. Genesis chapter 47 and verse 13. <clears throat> Tells us, Now there was no food in all the land, because the famine was very severe. So the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die in your presence? For our money's gone. Then Joseph said, Give up your livestock. And I will give you food for your livestock since your money's gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that all our money is spent, and the cattle are my Lord's, and there is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. That's pretty, got pretty tough there for a while, didn't it? <clears throat> Does any of that sound familiar? Do y'all watch the news? Did you know that Bill Gates and BlackRock and Vanguard and, and the Chinese are buying up all the houses and farmland in America right now? Have y'all heard them stories? You know what else? We're going to have to pay them all rent. They say we're going to own nothing and be happy by 2030. That's, that's what they're predicting. Not only that, they're buying up all the food process, processing plants everywhere. They're going to make us all eat bugs. We're going to have to eat bugs or die. Did you know that? Do you know there's only one thing we can do about that? I hope you all are ready. We've got to vote for God's chosen president in November to prevent all this from happening. <laughs> Is that true? I mean, do you all really believe that? I, I, want to, I want to explain something to you all. I want you all to understand a solid fact right here. The man in charge of putting God's people, Israel, into slavery in Egypt was who? He was God's chosen leader. He was a full-blooded, first-generation Israelite. He was the firstborn son of Jacob, Israel's favorite wife. His name was Joseph. He was head and shoulders above his brothers in righteousness. He was thrown in jail because he refused to commit adultery with Pharaoh's wife. He wasn't sniffing children and get paying off 
porn stars or whatever to, not to tell things about him. He was brought into Egypt as a slave. He was cast into prison for trying to do right. And yet he wound up being the number two man in charge under Pharaoh. How did that happen? Nobody could have done that but God Almighty. And to make sure, I mean, there wasn't, they didn't have any mail-in ballots or anything for him. He just, he wound up being appointed because he interpreted a dream for Pharaoh. And that dream is the one that predicted this famine. Therefore, he, he said, well, you need to find a wise man, put him in charge. And uh, he said, well, Joseph, you're wise enough to interpret the dream, so I'm going to put you in charge of it. So he's the one that had to store up everything. He's the one that sold it all. Genesis 41, 41, look at the amount of authority this man had. You know, we had a president, and they said he couldn't do nothing because Congress wouldn't let him do anything. Well, I'll tell you what authority this man had. Genesis 41, 41, Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. In verse 44, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or his foot in all of Egypt. How did Joseph get that position? Did he have a good campaign manager? I don't think so. I don't think so. Now, we know how they got into slavery. We know who put them into slavery or who was in charge of the process. Now, why were they in slavery? Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 20. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 20. He'll tell you why they were in slavery. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 20, he said, this is God speaking through Ezekiel. I said to them, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of Egypt. Who poured out the wrath? Was it Pharaoh? Was it Satan? No. It was God Almighty. He said he had warned them to cast away the detestable things from their eyes and to not defile themselves, but they did it anyway. Therefore, this is one more example showing that God's law did exist prior to that covenant at the mountain because apparently they had a law. God couldn't have convicted them of anything if he didn't have a law against it. Now let's look on down to Ezekiel 23. See what else he said about them. <clears throat> Ezekiel 23, we'll start in verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. And they played the harlot in Egypt. They played the harlot in their youth. Their breasts were pressed and their virgin bosom was handled. Their names were Ahola, the elder, and Aholabah, the sister. And they became man, and they bore sons and daughters. And as for their name, Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem is a whole of all. So God said he refused to cast away the detestable things in the idols. God called it playing the harlot in Egypt. And if you read the rest of Ezekiel 23, you can see it lasted all the way through the Babylonian, the Syrian and the Babylonian captivities. Let me ask you about today. Do the children of Israel keep any detestable things before their eyes? Do they have any idols they refuse to put away in the land today? Yeah way too many but that was why they were there God said he was aware of their suffering though and he decided to set them free well he was aware because he was the one punished them so what did he do he called out Moses and he sent them sent him to Pharaoh to plead with him to free the children and y'all know how that went he'd go in there and he would ask them to turn them loose and they wouldn't do it and he'd work a sign or a miracle send a plague and, and they did this over and over repeatedly and Pharaoh continually refused to let them go. He'd say, yeah, they can go. And as soon as the plague could be lifted, he'd change his mind and tell them they couldn't go. And finally, God commanded this Passover to take place. Now let's see what happened when they did this Passover. Let's look at Exodus 12, 29. <clears throat> Exodus 12, 29 is the story of the slaughter, the tragedy that took place in Egypt. It says, Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh 
who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up and get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel. Go and worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said. Go and bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste. It's like, y'all get out of here now. We will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up in the clothes on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. So Pharaoh sent them out with all their possessions, not just willingly, but he asked for a blessing. Now you talk about a change of attitude and a change of position. They went from being slaves to being paid a high ransom to get out of there. They didn't sneak out and they didn't fight their way out. The Egyptians paid them to go away. That's not usually how people get out of slavery. That, that, I mean, that's, that's nothing short of a miracle and only God Almighty could do that miracle. I believe that's one reason we're commanded to remember that. You remember Exodus 12, 14? It said, This day will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations and celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. That's a pretty good thing to remember. Now, if you're not aware, Passover is the only holiday, holy day, high day commanded in Scripture that actually has a makeup day. In case you cannot make it the first time, there is a day appointed that you can you can take it. it said Numbers nine, uh, chapter nine, verse nine. Numbers chapter nine, verse nine it says, "Then the Lord spake to Moses, saying, <clears throat> Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If any one of you or your generations becomes unclean because of a dead person or is on a distant journey." He may, however, observe the Passover to the Lord in the second month on the 14th day at twilight. They shall observe it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now to verify how serious he is, going down to verse 13. Numbers 9, 13. says here, But the man who is clean and is not on a journey and yet neglects to observe the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people. For he did not present the offering of the Lord at its appointed time. That man will bear his sin. So apparently this sacrifice and the blood had something to do with taking away their sin. Likewise today, if you don't apply the blood of Jesus to your spiritual house in a timely manner, you will bear your own sin. Notice also one of the first things he commanded was the eating of unleavened bread. So they were to eat it from, for seven days and remove all the leaven even from their houses. I think one script, one verse says for even from their borders. Now, Exodus 13, 7. He said this. It was re repeated again. We saw it in 12. Now we see it in 13 again. 13, 7 said, Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. Well, what is leaven? Physical leaven like yeast is added to bread dough. It's made to change the consistency. All women bake, you know what it is. Uh, and it changes the consistency or the texture of the dough. It causes carbon dioxide bubbles to form in the bread and it makes it rise. But that's okay if you want leavened bread, but what if you don't? What if you have bread that you don't want contaminated? Think about it like this. What is the bread of life? Jesus said in John 6, 48, I am the bread of life. Jesus also gave this commandment in Matthew 16, 6. Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. <clears throat> now the disciples weren't really sure what he meant. They didn't understand what he's talking about. So in verse 11, he explained it this way. He said, how is it you do not understand that I do not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So they, were, they understood it then. 
warnings from Jesus about the leaven is in three different Gospels. So it must be pretty important. Luke 12, 1, he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact leavened, unleavened. Excuse me. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we see that leaven is a type uh, referred to as the teaching of the Pharisees, could be false doctrine, traditions of men, uh, hypocrisy, which he accused the Pharisees of being hypocrites. Uh, Paul said we need to purge out the leaven of malice and wickedness and partake of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We know that Jesus is that bread because he alone is the truth. So it was basically a, 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 a symbol of what he, what Jesus would teach against in the New Testament. And we don't want the bread of life changed in any way because Jesus is that bread and we do not need to change his consistency at all. For that reason, once a year, at least, we need to spiritually clean house just like they did in those days. Not the leaven of bread, but that leaven that was spoken of by Jesus and Paul. We should diligently search our hearts and our minds for leaven and we should remove every trace of it that we can find. We need to examine ourselves and our hearts and our inner being and our inner, inner self to find out. We need to remove everything that, that could be or that looks like leaven. Now, if you notice, Paul did tell those Christian Israelites at Corinth to keep the feast. So obviously he knew Jesus had not eliminated it. But in doing it, the only way we do it is to reflect on ourselves. We need to come together as a body of believers. We need to evaluate our thoughts and actions over the past year, we need to see if we've received any new doctrines or any new teaching among the body. We need to determine if they're biblical. Uh, if they are, we need to affirm them among the congregation and put them into our daily practice. Likewise, if, any, if we've picked up anything that's wrong, we need to throw it out just like they threw out the leaven. We should always be in a growth process and learning things from the Word of God. It says we ever need to increase in the knowledge of Jesus. But we need to be careful and pay attention to what he said in 1 John 4, 1, where he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And that's, that's very critical to keep an eye on. We need to just consider how we're doing in general. How are we doing in keeping God's word straight in our heart? Are we, doing, are we following the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord with all your heart. Love the neighbors, love your neighbors yourself. Or are we doing like our forefathers did in Egypt and worshiping idols? Uh, we need to get detestable things out from front of our eyes and get rid of our idols. Uh, are we playing harlots like they did? You know, it's easier than you think it is. Uh, if y'all remember the story, Aaron made that golden calf at the mountain and they named it Yahweh. So in like manner, how many of our people are, are calling themselves Christians, going to churches every Sunday and worshiping the wrong Jesus? You know, they're worshiping something they call Jesus. They may have a Jesus that put the law away. They might have a raptured Jesus. They may have a, a Jesus that loves everybody and hates nobody. They might have a Jesus that's going to burn you in hell fire while your friends and neighbors are looking at you burning, sitting there playing a harp on a cloud. Uh, that, all that's got to be watched for. There's a lot of false religion, false doctrine, and downright just filth that's, that's being sent our way by way of the television, the internet, and, and so many other things, and our public schools. And all of these are major sources of leaven that will get into our lives and into our homes if we let them. I think for us to do a week without any outside influence by all that media and news and politics and social media and... and I think it would do us all good a week to cast out all that leaven and just focus on God's Word and do away with that. <clears throat> now, what did Jesus think about the Passover? Did He get rid of it or not? Luke twenty-two fifteen, He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom comes. 
And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup after they'd eaten, saying, This is this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So we see that Jesus did celebrate the Passover and he changed the Passover. That established the new covenant when he did that. This gave us a new ritual to observe because his blood was about to be shed as a permanent Passover sacrifice. That would bring an end to the animal sacrifices forever. He also stated he would not do it again until it was fulfilled in the kingdom. But in saying that, that means that he was going to do it again. He fulfilled that sacrifice with his death on the cross. So now we don't slaughter a lamb, but instead we celebrate the blood that was shed by the perfect Lamb of God on the cross. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And this is one of the only two commands that Jesus ever gave about anything or any manner of a memorial service to commemorate himself. There was never any celebration commanded for any fertility goddess called Ishtar, and there was never a celebration commanded for his birthday. These holidays we know as Easter and Christmas are pagan festivals. And when you really look into those in the, in the Scripture, they are condemned. They are an abomination to God. There are only two rituals commanded by Jesus Christ himself. They are both intended to memorialize his death. That's what brought in the new covenant. The loaf and the cup represents his body that was beaten, bruised, tortured, and sacrificed, and his blood that was shed on the cross for us. And the baptism in water represents his death, his burial, and his resurrection. If we want to offer correct worship that's pleasing to God, we have to do it the way that he commands, not make up our own vain traditions. Now about the actual Passover deliverance, what happened? God struck every house not covered by the blood and Pharaoh told them to take their families and cattle and everything and get out of there and go worship God. So that's what they did, right? Children of Israel sent out of Egypt. They went to worship God. And what happened after that? It says that they went out of Egypt three days journey. They worshiped God. He forgave their sins. Then he told them, go back to Egypt, back to the same life they were living before as slaves and continue making bricks for Pharaoh. Did I read that wrong? <laughs> I don't think it said that. It said, oh, it says everybody was happy because they knew they would either die and go to heaven or they would get raptured and go to heaven. I don't, does your, your version have it? Mine don't either. No, I'm sorry. That's the Judeo-Christian version. In reality, Jesus is our Passover. And he did not shed his blood on the cross so we could spend our lives in bondage. He came to deliver us not only from the penalties of sin, but from our enemies. What does it say in Luke chapter 1? Luke 1, 68, what does it say? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited us and accomplished redemption for His people and has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of David, His servant, as He spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from old. Salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. It's really a simple concept, but most stiff-necked Israelites refuse to understand. Our sin is what puts us in bondage. Jesus came to forgive that sin and show us how to be free. John 8, 34, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. God sent Jesus as our perfect Passover lamb to deliver us, just like the deliverance in Egypt. Not just forgiveness of our sins, but deliverance from the hand of our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Well, does anybody hate us? Really? I sure hope they do, because here's what Jesus said in Mark 6.22. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. <laughs> okay? 
white men can't jump, but yeah. Behold, your reward is great in heaven. Amen. For the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Well, who hates us today? Do you own a TV or do you ever get on the internet? Pretty clear. Straight white Christian males are probably the most hated and maligned people on the face of the earth. If you listen to junk they're putting out on TV and stuff being taught in the public schools, white Christian people are the cause of nearly every problem on the face of the earth. But I'm going to tell you something. They're technically correct. It's probably going to hurt your feelings. Do you know why? Anybody want to guess why? The world is in the shape it's in now for one reason. God's people, the children of Israel, and even starting all the way back at Adam, have failed to obey Him and enforce His law in the earth. There's really nobody else to, to blame but us. We're the only ones. Us and our parents and our forefathers for disobeying God's law. There's nobody else to blame. You, you, can't, you can blame the Jews, you can blame the Masons. You, it don't matter, but it's, it's, it's our fault. In Scripture now, we always read about the Passover being kept in connection with restoration and the returning of people to proper worship and to God's law. There's usually deliverance of the people and, and gathering back to God and all that type of thing. Now, here's a story. There's, there's four or five places where, where we see that the Passover either was kept or was restored. Uh, one of the first ones is in the book of Joshua, chapter 5, verse 10. It uh, says they had, God had just opened the way across the Jordan River. They'd come across and they'd encamped there at Gilgal and they had circumcised all the men. Joshua 5.10 tells us that while the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plain of Jericho. On the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. Now, the next couple stories are found in, Hez in uh, Kings and Chronicles. Hezekiah and Josiah both restored proper worship of the temple, and they held Passover. Those stories are in 2 Kings 23, 2 Chronicles 30 and 35. You ought to go read them sometime. We've got another place where it was kept when they restored the temple in the days of, in the book of Ezra. I think it was in Ezra chapter 6 where they kept it after they restored the temple. Now, what was God's purpose for the Passover? <clears throat> Why did he have the Passover? Ezekiel 16, 6. Ezekiel chapter 16, starting in verse 6, he said, "Is <clears throat> God talking about Israel. When I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. I made you numerous like the plants of the field. Then you grew up and became tall and reached the age for fine ornaments. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. Then I passed by you and I saw you and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. Then he said this in Exodus 19.4. said, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples of the earth, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So the first Passover happened when God saw that Israel was ready for marriage. He came in like a knight in shining armor. He rescued his princess. This was the beginning of the marriage proposal. As such, we're commended to keep this feast as an anniversary celebration forever. It is important to our God. You know, all you people out here that are married, let me ask you this. How long do you expect your spouse to celebrate the anniversary with you? Well, I know what all the women are thinking. I know what the men better say if they don't want to sleep outside tonight. <laughs> but 
But God feels the same way. You know, He feels the same way. He wants His anniversary to be celebrated. That's a special occasion to Him. You know, the bride always wants to remember the wedding and the dress and the pretty flowers and all that. Uh, the husband wants wants her to remember how he come in on that white horse and slayed, you know, slew the dragon and rescued her. And really, we're actually commanded to remember both and teach them to our children. Now, knowing that the Passover was the beginning of the betrothal of Israel, that was the time when he came in and rescued her from slavery and took her, what did he do? He took her out into the wilderness, up to the mountain, and he married her. Right? Well, my Bible says there's no new thing under the sun. My Bible says that which was is that which shall be. Now, we do know God divorced Israel and put her away, but we know He promised to bring her back. That was spoken of in Hosea chapter 2. If you read Hosea chapter 2, the first 13 verses are God explaining why He's divorcing her uh, because she's a playing a harlot. But then in Hosea 2.14, He said this, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. That's exactly what He did the first time, is it not? Uh, and we know Jesus shed his blood on the cross to make that possible so he could take his wife again. And we also read in the last book of Scripture, the Revelation, that there's going to be another great marriage in the future. Well, if there's nothing new, can we use the past to predict the future? I think we can. Uh, will we see another great deliverance leading up to that marriage? Well, I'd say so. We got a lot of parables and things in Scripture. We do know that the blood had to be applied to get to first Passover. Now, how do we apply that blood today? Revelation 19, 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. There's a fire again. <clears throat> And on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed with fine linen, white and clean, were following on white horses. And Revelation 7, 13, one of the elders said, answered, was saying to me, Who are those clothed in white robes? Who are they and where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Wow. I guess they missed the rapture because they were, it says they came out of tribulation. I don't know what happened there. Now, how did they get their robes white? How did they get these robes the same as Jesus has? What about Galatians 3.27? For all you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. It sounds like getting those garments has something to do with baptism. You also need to think about the story of the virgins. Five of them had oil for their lamps and five of them had none. Many say that that oil is the Holy Spirit. Where do you get the Holy Spirit? I think everybody in here knows Acts 2.38. Peter said, Repent each of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And also remember what Jesus said in Matthew 26.28. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sin. Well, Peter also said in Acts that baptism is for forgiveness of sin. Starting to sound like that baptism thing is reasonably important. <clears throat> All right, what about the other sacrament, communion? What did Jesus say about it? John 6, 56, Jesus said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Therefore, he basically requires that the the ceremony be kept. The cup and the loaf is to be partaken of by His people. Now, I know a lot of people say, oh, you're teaching works for salvation. You know, salvation is a free gift and we don't do anything to earn it. Now, I'm not teaching works. Uh, it is a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. Deliverance from Egypt was a free gift. Those people did absolutely nothing to earn their deliverance. But what would have happened if they had not obeyed the command? The Word of God says we have to believe and obey the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1.6 says, For after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So apparently you got to obey 
And apparently there's judgment and retribution coming to those who do not obey. Peter also said with difficulty you're the righteous are saved. But the preacher on TV said it's easy. All you got to do is accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Just let Him come into your heart. Well, I mean, have you ever seen that anywhere in the Bible? Let me tell you this. If you're one of His, Jesus Christ is already your personal Savior. Read about what it says here about the workings of the Antichrist in Revelation 13, 7. It says it was also given to Him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Now, apparently some names were written in the book from the foundation of the world. Some were not. Look what Jesus told the church at Sardis in Revelation 3, 5. He said, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. There's white garments again. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. If you're one of his, your name is already written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. What you have to do and I have to do is make sure it does not get erased. That's what scripture just said. <clears throat> I think the King James says he could be blotted out. So instead of trying to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, let me tell you what we better learn to do. We better learn to accept Him as our lawgiver, our King, our Lord, and our Master. That's what we better, because my Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Here's what Jesus thinks about your faith-only doctrine. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and your name cast out demons and perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now these were... Christian people, they thought they were. they were. They were believers. They said they were casting out demons and doing mighty works in His name. He said, you practice lawlessness, get out. Well, doesn't the majority of Judeo-Christianity tell us that the law has been put away? We don't have a law? That's what they say. But the new covenant is made of the law. The law is the new covenant. What did He say in, what did he say in Hebrews 8.10? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws, my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Well, if the law is dead, is he going to put a dead law into your mind and into your heart? I don't think so. It don't sound like it's been put away. And read some more things. That, uh, another warning given here by our sweet lovey Jesus, you know, your personal Savior. Luke 19, 27, Jesus said this, But these enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now this is the stuff that Judeo-Christianity and everybody else in the world hates. They want a sweet Savior, but they don't want to obey the King and His law. I think the obedience starts with the baptism. I believe that's important. I believe we need to keep the Passover. I believe we need to uh, at least make an honest effort to obey His laws. Uh, not for salvation, because you're saved already if you're one of His. Uh, you men folks, do y'all take your wife out or bring her flowers just to, so, just to keep her from divorcing you? I don't think so. You do it to express your love. Well, God wants us to express our love, and how do we do that? John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In John 15, 9, Jesus said, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Then closing, we need to consider that the entire nation was required to keep the Passover to be delivered from Egypt. Anybody that did not apply the blood suffered the workings of the destroyer. This didn't happen until God saw that Israel was ready for marriage. Another way to look at this, 
as far as end time preparedness is found in Mark 4.26. It's another parable given by Jesus. And he said the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed on the soil. And he goes to bed at night, gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He himself does not know how. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. When does he harvest? It says when the crop permits. Well, he's planted wheat. How many of y'all believe that Jesus is going to return and dwell here with us and reign forever in his kingdom right here on earth? Y'all believe that? How many of y'all want to know when it's going to happen? Probably everybody. I can tell you exactly when it's going to happen if you really want me to. You know, people speculate about it all the time. And we hear, how many predictions have we heard now? Hundreds or whatever, you know. Uh, but everyone I've heard so far has been wrong. But I can show, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, but I think I can show you from Scripture when it's going to happen. Revelation 19.7 said, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was given her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Did they say she was in fine linen because she believed Jesus and accepted Him as her Savior? No. Absolutely not. It said the fine linen was made from righteous acts. That means she had to work or she had to do something to get that dress to be ready to get married. Well, what are the righteous acts that have to be accomplished? Look at this passage here and see if you can tell me. Hebrews 10, 12. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Did that just say Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool? The way I understand it, he's not going to return until that happens. Therefore, if we want to see the harvest and we want to be in that wedding with our great Savior Jesus Christ, there are certain things that have got to be accomplished. The wheat has to bear fruit worthy of harvest. The bride has to clean herself up and do some righteous acts to get her wedding dress. Or in other words, somebody has to make his enemies his footstool. So in reality, are we waiting on Jesus to do something? Or is he waiting on us? As far as bearing fruit, Matthew 3, 7, John said this to the Pharisees when he saw them coming out. He said, uh, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We've got to repent to bear fruit. It all requires repentance and obedience on our part. That's how we inherit the kingdom that he's been trying to give us from the day one. When he gives it to us, we'll be in it with him for eternity. I believe when our people are ready to tear down the idols and celebrate his Passover once again as a nation, he will come to be with us. How many does it take to do it? I don't know. Uh, Gideon started out with 32,000 men, wound up with 300 against a big force. And we got a big force against us today, said in Judges 7 12. The Midianites and Amalekites and all the sons of the east were in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number. Well, sometimes we seem overwhelmed and we see that we're such a small number, there are not many of us here. And we see enemies everywhere we look. And you get discouraged and you think, well, there's nothing we can do. Well, if you remember, there was no way out when they got to the Red Sea, but they had a miracle. I think once we begin to pray and seek His face, once we begin to cry out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for deliverance, once we turn from our wicked ways and start bearing fruit, He will show us firsthand the true meaning of the Passover. He will take His bride to Himself once again, and we'll marry her. I think that should be our goal in life. I think we need to get bearing fruit, I think we need to get ready for the harvest and I think we need to get the wedding dress on the bride and get her ready. Once the man sees the fruit is ready and once the man sees the wedding dress is on, then it can begin and not before. I pray that we're smart enough and <laughs> to see that needs to be done and I pray that he'll give us his spirit and his guidance to let us do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, and we 
thank you for letting us come together here. We ask that you help us do the work that we need to do to get into your kingdom. For all this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>